I would drink you drink of gold. I'd be the same new poetry. And I would keep you from all harm. Hello and welcome to episode 18 of Popcorn and Prosecco, where Christy, Angie, and I are back in the same room again to talk about How to Train Your Dragon 2, Obvious Child, and 22 Drum Street. All right, who's kicking it off? I'll kick it off with How to Train Your Dragon 2. So this one uh, takes us back to the island of Burke, where the Vikings and the dragons are now friends. Where five years later, Hiccup is 20, as are all his little buddies. And while his dad wants Hiccup to follow in the family business of being the leader of Burke, um, Hiccup wants to go and explore the world with his friend Toothless. So when doing that, he discovers there is another dragon rider, a um, mysterious dragon rider, and he also discovers there is an evil dragon trainer who is amassing an army for world conquest um, and he needs to stop them with the help of friendly dragons so yeah that's the plot um, how to train your dragon 2 it's by the same director Dean DeBlo uh, who did the first movie and he wrote and directed this one and it's cool because you get to it takes us outside of the Burke we know into these like new lands there's new dragons there's new characters one of them played by Kate Blanchett and she's badass one of those played by Jon Snow or Kit Harington. He's else. pretty good in it. That is more emote. He does more emoting like <laughs> with his voice in this movie than you see in most seasons. Yeah, of Game that's of what happens. Also, when you a bad head character. Yeah, and facial expression. Yeah, he's like, more animated. <laughs> Kit Harington is way more fun in this movie than he's been on anything ever. It's um, the first time that I was like, Kit Harington. Yeah, I like that guy. <laughs> he's what's got funny? a career. And what's funny is like, especially because he's Jon Snow and so many girls swoon over him in this movie. Um, I forget if it's Rough Nut or Tough Nut. The girl that Kristen Wiig plays. Yeah. I think like, Rough Nut's the girl, right? I don't remember. One she, she literally drools over him all the time in his muscles. And what I love, and this is so... It's so subversive for a kid's movie. There's female gaze in How to Train Your Dragon. Which, if you don't know what that means, it basically means that typically movies are come from kind of a male perspective where we look at women as sexual objects. But in this one... It's Egret, son of Egret. Or, no, not Egret. No, it, it's no. something like that. It's really close. Oh, I know I'm getting my- Eric! It's Eric, Eric. son of Eric. Oh. You said you greet and now <laughs> yeah. you made it sad. <laughs> the camera Sorry guys. God damn you. I was like, wait. I was like, no, it's close but wrong. I was like, is that a joke? It's confusing because there's also joke. dragons and there's a lot going on. Um, yeah. But yeah, overall I like this movie. I don't think the story is as tight as the last one, but I think the character work is really beautiful. I think the dream works up the game on the design. I think it's like everyone's a little older and it's amazing because all of the guys are like trying out facial hair and oh, young they guy. They do a really hair. good job with that. They take the five year time gap really seriously. Yeah. yeah. Like, the conditions in the in the village in Burke really change. Like you could see how they've like completely changed their entire way of life. And then all the characters, they look more mature. And not yeah. it's not even just like different hair or facial hair. Like I was literally sitting on my computer before comparing two shots of Hiccup and there, there's something about like it the is bone structure look, of it his looks face. Older the way yeah. I really thought about yeah. it. And like it's like nice little touches. Like one of my favorite little touches in the movie is early on in the film, um, he and Ashton are talking and their boyfriend and girlfriend thinks they're cool and she's just idly braiding his hair. Yeah. <laughs> and she makes two little braids, and it's such a little thing, but they're in his hair the rest of the movie. Yeah. And, and it's such a nice, really cute, sweet yeah. touch. It's like a really smart little touch that the, that kind of continuity just really informs the movie. And um, There are a lot of fun little things like that. Like, even the dragons get it, too. Like, I was really excited by, uh, shit, now I forget the dragon's name. But when Toothless meets, uh, now I forget her name, uh, the mother. Yeah. Valka, when he meets her dragon and yeah. they become buddy buddy and like they have a relationship going it's not just like oh they play together and like acknowledge each other no toothless is like the baby that's always doing these things to get to like annoy him and yeah. in like a sibling rivalry kind of way and that kind of stuff goes a and, long way and the dragon like, looks like, like a muppet like very strong oh muppet features which yeah. i was like right? cloud Especially jumper it, you know, but what I love all about, I care about is the dragons. I know them all their names. Yeah, what I love about pets, pets, this movie is it's very much a pet movie. Oh my god. It's it's like everyone that loves animals got really upset. That's what I movie. wrote in my review. <laughs> like, if you don't have a pet, you're gonna want one, and if you have a pet, <laughs> you're gonna go home and wanna squeeze it to death. I have a pet and I want a toothless. My cat is not good enough. Alright, I want a toothless also. I'm just kidding, Roger, if you're watching this. I still love you, baby. <laughs> 
Uh, but no, I mean, you were talking about like the way that you see the relationships between the dragons, and like one of the little ways that they make the world seem really textured is that a lot of it just plays out in the background. Like you'll, you'll have two characters mm -hmm. in the foreground, human characters, it's so true. that are like talking. But if you actually watch the background, you'll see like there's like a whole it's little like drama two, playing out with like Toothless and like Toothless and, yeah, and the other dragons. It's like a silent film times. in the background of like Toothless trying to win the. I don't want to say affections because it doesn't seem romantic. It seems like um, like respect or something. Like it's, he's yeah, trying so he just, hard. Like, wants to be their buddy. Like he's like kind of like the kid brother that like wants to be with the cool crowd if anything. It's yeah. really really cute. And the baby dragons, the cat lady. Yeah, there's like a crazy cat lady. That lady might be my favorite her. character. That was really funny. Like you see her in the last movie, but in this one she comes out at one point and she's covered in baby dragons, and you're just like you instantly recognize that archetype. You're like, oh, she's the crazy cat lady except with dragons. Yeah, That's and it like adorable. it normalizes that all very beautifully. The only things that I didn't like about this movie, I have a feeling you're not going to be happy about one of them based on what you just said, but I don't like the mother character, Okay. and I don't like Drogo either. Drago? Drago. Drogo. Drogo is also Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. No, they're, they're trying to trip us up. It's very confusing. But my problem with Valka is it's super cool when she's the mysterious dragon rider, and I like the fact that it shows where Hiccup got his thing with dragons from. Right. Which also but the second she's unmasked and she comes clean, he just, she, this woman disappeared when he was a baby and she's been gone for 20 years. She has access to a ton of flying dragons and never once bothered to go home. I also thought and that- just goes for it. I also wish that they had done more with the characters. One of the, when she was first introduced, one of the most interesting things to me about that character is that she has kind of an isolationist philosophy where like, Whereas Hiccup is going out and trying to change people's minds about dragons, her her take is more just like, you know what, fuck it, like people are never gonna come around, I'm just gonna chill here by myself and take care of my dragons. And I thought that there would be more of a conflict, but they it's introduced, it's a really interesting tension, and then it doesn't really go anywhere meaningful. Or like, even if they had used that to like make her socially inept in a way. Like, yeah, she like, had I, to I feel like the, everybody. I kind of felt like the movie, like Hiccup, as you pointed out, is automatically invested in her and cares about her and likes her. And I felt like the movie kind of her. assumes so this, it does it too. I felt yeah, like they, the movie they kind of assumed assume that we would also be on the same page, yeah. whereas like I didn't necessarily feel like I was just kind of like who is this new character that's coming into this world that I already like? Like, who are you? What is your deal? No, you have to earn my I like her affection. as a character, but I, I do I do think it's problematic that they give her such a dark thing, especially in a kids' movie where, and I mean, she is kidnapped by dragons, but as we point out, like, she has access, she could have gotten home, she could have gotten to work, yeah. um, but she doesn't. She never even goes to check up on him, and um, because they don't develop that more, it does, it left a lot of people being like, well wait, why is that something we're, like, I, I, I think that's totally fair. I mostly just kind of liked the idea of this character a lot, and I liked how, it was also, because one of um, our commenters on Cinema Blend commented they didn't like the idea that Hiccup's mother was going to take away from his journey in that, like, oh, this has always been a part of him because of her. But it's like, when you see the movie, that's actually not true. They show you a flashback where, like, Hiccup is who Hiccup is. And I thought that was really beautifully done. We have a cat buying for popcorn. Um, um, but yeah, I I understand there are problems. I, like I said, I think structurally there's problems, especially in the second act. I feel like a lot of stuff has to happen for the plot, and we're kind of left going, wait, what just went on? Um, That's the me, problem with Drago. Is yeah. that like really? He's the what, bad guy to be. What did what did he amount to in the end? Why was he doing what he was doing? And why did we need him? We didn't need him. And this isn't a spoiler because I'm pretty sure it was in the uh, it was in the trailer. And I think it's in a lot of press material out there. Is that there are these alpha dragons, and he has one. Yeah. And that's basically his only purpose in the movie. It's similar to Balka actually. Her main purpose in the movie is to open up the world to this cave full of dragons. His purpose is to bring in this out yeah, dragon. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they but, like they, what, they seem more the like they're there to serve the plot than to be like characters that we care about all that much. Yeah, or has a little has much fighting. motivation. Like, what, what was Drago even after? He just wanted to control the world. It with does dragons? feel. It, okay, now, the more yeah. that I think about it, the more it feels like a bridge. Um, I mean, no, the, but like that was a little bit of a problem in the first film too, where like you're very invested in like Hiccup and like to a lesser extent Astrid. And to also, you know, also to a lesser extent, stoic. But like, 
like for example, I can I still could not name all of his like friends. Mm -hmm. Like I know what they look like, but I could Fish not legs. tell you what. That was, what I could not tell you who's 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 which one is which. Yeah. Or like what their personalities really are, and like you know, it, it's a little bit disappointing. Put a little more now because they had like that, that, that thing where both of them have a crush on her, and that was a little something. There's a little more decision. It's a little bit. It's, it's, but they don't. They it's still don't have that to get much the gang back together. together. Right. But narratively, it's messy. But I think we should wrap up this section. So, would you recommend people see Have Trader Dragon? Too? Oh my God, yes! If you have a pet, your heart is just going to melt. You're gonna want a pet. You're gonna you're gonna want every freaking How to Train Your Dragon product too. Because who was I doing it with? Where we were? You were sending me yeah. pictures. It was yeah. Just like, it was a bunch of text we messages. We all need a toothless in our lives. Go see this movie. Yeah, I would recommend it too. I mean, I didn't get a chance to talk about this at length, but like in the first one, one of my favorite things was like all the flying scenes. This one, like, oh my god, I love it. Like, um, they got so, yes, also also for the pets, but also like just like being there and like watching it in three D is a good experience. You really feel like you're flying with them. It was a great experience. So yeah, it has its issues, but overall, yeah, I recommend. I think it's fun. I think it's sweet and lighthearted, and you know, I think if you have kids, they'll eat it up. So yes. Yeah. And it's, I think all around, it's three thumbs up from us. Yay! So Do we take... approves too? Is he even in frame? I don't know. I don't but think Zoom is there. in he's... frame, but I think if he knew how much you wanted a toothless, he might not approve so much, because then he would know. He was giving us some serious side eye earlier. Aww. See, it makes you want to hug your pets, and it makes them want to run away. <laughs> it does not make them want to hug you. Butt in my face. So I don't sad. like that, do we? Alright, uh, obvious child. Yes. So, <laughs> oh, wow. moving on. Um, I'm gonna talk about Obvious Child, which is it, it's an abortion romantic comedy, which <laughs> is not a combination of words you hear very often. It was directed by is it Gillian Robespierre? Is that her name? I'm not even gonna try. Yeah, it's Gillian Robespierre. Something like that. I'm really sorry. I couldn't. I forgot to like memorize that ahead of time. Um, and it stars Jenny Slate, and it's just about her. She gets so Jenny Slate is the main character. She gets out of a breakup. She has a one night stand. She gets pregnant. And, the story, and then she decides immediately to have an abortion, which in itself is like actually kind of, kind of, you know, groundbreaking breaking because like in every other movie we've seen where that happens, like a Juno or Knocked Up or whatever, it's always like, you know, if they even, if they even like think about shit. having an abortion, it's like immediately dismissed. And this is one of the very few movies I've seen where like someone that seems like the kind of person where you can imagine that in real life a woman in this situation would seriously consider having an abortion or have one. Yeah. And it's it, it was really it, it felt really groundbreaking to like see that. And and not only that, this abortion in this movie is treated the way that I think it's treated in real life by real people, which is that it's neither like, you know, the worst, most tragic thing that's happened to her, nor a decision to be taken lightly. Like yeah. she takes it very seriously, but it's also just like, you know, another another step in her life. It's not like, oh my god, this is gonna change the course of my entire life and it's gonna weigh on me forever. And it was really refreshing. Yeah, but what's interesting about it especially is when she goes to set up the appointment, they tell her that she has to wait a few more weeks because of developmental reasons and they said, um, so the earliest we can book you is, um, are you free on the 14th? She goes February 14th, Valentine's Day. And like, that communicates the tone of this movie to a T. It's really just one of those just kind of like, like, like when la life is laughing at your miseries. And, um, <laughs> and they're like, we could do the 15th. And she's like, that's my mom's birthday. We'll just do the 14th. And like, I, like, that is what this movie is. It's just a whole lot of laughing at her problems. Yeah, I mean, I want to totally relate, because it's like sometimes you do just feel like that there's this, the, the universe is laughing at you. I mean, I started out saying that it's groundbreaking, and it is, and I think that's a great reason to watch the movie, but an even greater Sounds reason is that it's before. genuinely really, like, funny and sweet and entertaining, like, Jenny Slate's brand of comedy. Christy is gonna go deal with the cat because she's a kind person. He was he likes about to, to, push he was about to break my phone. So thank you, Christy. Um, <laughs> now just your bag will be sacrificed. That's okay. There's nothing breakable in there. I don't think. Anyway, we'll find out. next time I want to give people bum, a little doing. <laughs> um, so it's just it, it's it's really funny. Jenny Slate's uh, she's in the movie. She plays a stand-up comedian, and her comedy is like very specific and very funny and like, very graphic. Like, and very graphic. The movie starts with her talking about vaginal excretions, mm. <laughs> and it's like if that makes you go like, oh god, then this may not be the movie for you. Which is a service because I feel like there's a few people that might be turned off by this movie. Just immediately, like, is this fine. is who we are. Yeah, you know, deal with it. Either you're in or you're out. It's unafraid. <laughs> it's it's saying like yeah, it's it's a comedy I'm like I've seen before. Um, I mean, 
Is Talking there... about it now makes me want to go see it again and write down more of her jokes. Because oh every God, single so one of her jokes was funny. I can't remember the last time that I've laughed out loud throughout so much of a movie. Because, you know, most of the time with this kind of stuff, and I, I guess with movies, like, I'm, I mean, just thinking of, like, funny people off the top of my head, uh -huh. where it's got all of the, uh, the better comedic material at the beginning, and yeah. then it gets serious. This, I mean, this does get serious. You know, she she gets she gets serious and emotional yeah, about it. She, yeah. It's not like it's all one big joke. She has real feelings, but the laughs are there from yeah. start to finish. And it's really sweet. Jake Lacey plays the guy that she hooked up with, who you know she's now pregnant with his child. He's the guy from the last season of the Office, and he's just, he's, what is Dewey doing? He's right hanging out behind I'm the so table. So sorry, but sorry. The perils of recording in person. <laughs> um, um, so silent partner. I hope right. he doesn't get into that bag. Um, anyway, I thought that he, I thought that he, you know, he was, he was also, he came across really well. Like, he was really likable, he was, like, funny. Which I you should explain. I can't she believe does she didn't go, go for him at the very beginning. She goes to find the guy from the One Night Stand because she's kind of debating whether or not she should tell him. Right. And what's interesting is that makes it sound like it's going to be, like, a Lifetime movie. Of she being, doesn't like, go to find him, though. Well, she's, she's hearing run, it. She's just running away. away. She thinks she's about whether it. to tell him. And I then think, he shows up in her yeah. life because... First, like, like five tries times to find her. Yeah, and then it's like quizzes. <laughs> but, like, it's one of those things where in a romantic comedy, it would be like, ba -ba -da -ba -da, we're supposed to be together because we keep showing up together. And in this, she's like, it, it almost feels like the universe is, like, spitting in her eye because it's like, here's the guy who's, like, who put a baby in you and she doesn't know how to handle it. And she's very emotionally immature, but in a way that, like, I can relate to. I, like, in my review, I compared it to, it reminds me of Inside of Amy Schumer in Broad City where it's not just the like you know whimsical parts of being a young woman it's the ugly unfun parts of being a young woman and yeah like, it reminded me a little bit of girls in that sense because i haven't seen the show I was that you mentioned of girls but also. it's yeah. she's not as like off-putting as some of the characters in girls which i like the show it's not but confrontational as girls yeah, yeah, yeah it's also girls. more like laugh out loud worthy than girls too yeah, yeah. some of the stuff in girls has gotten a little it's darker a little, like, with darker like, drugs and yeah. yeah this is not that i think it's more like broad city to that point and like um it's just really smart and fun and, and Speaking of girls, though, I really like Gabby Hoffman in this. Gabby Hoffman She's is great. Though. She plays She's, the best friend. And it's incredible how she can go from such like an outrageous like character that you don't even want to be near in girls yeah. to someone who feels like a really good, warm friend. Yeah, yeah. Like she's believable and you were like I, I feel like we all have a friend like Gabby Hoffman who like uh, kind of knows us for the ugly little freak show we can be and loves us anyway. Like Gabby Hoffman's great in this and like yeah, it's and um, Richard Kind plays Jenny Slade's dad in this, and I'm forgetting who plays her mom, but she's great. There's That's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Like yeah, she's sitting, when she's sitting in the bed with the mom and yeah. they're just talking. Yeah, yeah. it's it's a really thoughtful spoil anything, movie. But. No, yeah, it's like, it's I mean, I was really blown away by this movie because it seems like the kind of thing that it wants seems a miracle that it exists because it's it. They say abortion. She has an abortion. Yeah. That's all things that happen, and that just seems so completely... Abortion schmushmorshin. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. When they and couldn't then... even say it in Knocked Up. That was on TV yeah. the other day, and I was like, oh, right, you're in the comedy where you could not even bring yourself yeah, you to could say show the a crowning word without right. warning us. But, yeah, but then it's like, conversely, it feels like something we should have had already. Like, watching it didn't make me feel uncomfortable. It just made me feel, like, somehow recognized. Like... Some of her jokes are so, like, just there's things about it that it's like I could totally relate to, but I've never heard someone say in a movie. Oh my god. Yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's like okay, so it's not early on about vaginal secretions. Like, <laughs> one of the reasons I was laughing so hard is because I was like, this is shit that every girl knows, but nobody talks about there's a lot, Yeah, there's, there's like, a lot of that stuff. But, like, you might hear in a comedy club, because in a comedy club it's like, what, 30 people? So, like, if people aren't on board or whatever, but, like, it's a very different thing. It's also movie. nice because she's so close to our age, too. Like, yeah. everything that she was dealing with is very relatable. I mean, not every little thing, but a lot of it. Yeah. yeah. It, felt, it really did feel like watching one of your friends, you know, someone that you would actually know, go through something that would actually happen to them. Uh, albeit, you know, these people are much funnier than we are, but and better written. <laughs> but, you know, overall, it felt, like, it felt very real. <laughs> now, yeah, I, I think... Um, yeah, I think we're all big fans of this one. It was just like, it's, it's such a, like a warm, sweet, and it's hilarious sweet. movie. I feel like people are going to hear abortion rom-com and cringe, but like, it's yeah. really sweet, this movie. I think people also sit through this entire movie and picture Marcel the shell with shoes on. Because <laughs> that yeah. is her voice. Yeah. <laughs> Perry was traumatized because she that's what she knows Jenny Slate yeah. the whole time. She Mar was thinking about Marcel Marcella got pregnant and had an abortion. 
You're like, Marcel, what has happened to you? This is not the Marcel. On that girl. note, maybe we should move on to our next topic, but I'm assuming this is... This <laughs> Another is, three thumbs up, I this, think. Yeah, thumbs up all around for this one. Yeah. All right, so I've got this next one. 22 Jump Street. So it's Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum back again, and this time they literally move from 21 Jump Street to 22 Jump Street, where they have a much nicer facility. And this time around, their case takes place on a college campus where they're assigned to pretend to be college students and figure out who is selling this deadly drug called Wi-Fi, W-H-Y-P-H-Y. And all this crazy stuff happens. And kind of similar to how it went down in high school, the two of them end up in two separate kind of social Six. groups. Uh, Channing Tatum, I, see I never know what to call them when I'm talking about them. Uh, they're fake names. They're Jake and Schmidt. Schmidt. I think Janko and Schmidt, and then it's Doug and Brad. And Brad. Brad. Yeah. But Our, I, well, I'm just going to say Channing Tatum was funny. in the frat, and Jonah Hill was not very welcome to the frat. He was kind of like an outcast, but he got the girl. He ends up Which with, like, makes he no ends sense. To, to the extent that he ends up in any <laughs> like, he ends much. up with like the artsy group. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And he starts dating, um, is, it, is her name Ashley Stevens? From, uh, uh, from Greek? I don't know. She's like, a spoiler. That is a oh, spoiler. Oh, fuck me. <laughs> oh, bummer. Well, I'm gonna cut that out somehow. Do you want to start over? No, it's okay. Let's keep going. Okay. I can edit this. Um, but yeah, Jonah Hill gets Stupid. the girl again. Which one? We never find out what happened to Brie Larson's character, which is She's weird. She's never because even referenced. Or because the movie is obsessed with the first movie. Because they're like, aside from the plot line, there's a whole meta context to it where they keep talking about how sequels are never as good and they're just repeats of the same thing and blah 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 blah. And there's all these jokes about how you guys did so well with the last mission, we gave you more money this time. And then there's like a point where they've run out of money, so they tried to shoot this chase scene by not using money. So there's like a part where you see them drive into a building and they're like, wow, there are lots of robots, but we're still outside. Yeah. And like <laughs> stuff like that. I loved the self-aware part of this. Sure. Part of this stuff. But that, that's what is what I had That's why of. not mentioning Brie Larson is weird to me. And also too, that in two movies, the she Jonah Hill- cameo. Yeah, the Jonah Hill had a hand in writing. He ends up with a girl who is super good looking. And from like, I have no idea why he's supposed to be attractive in this. I'm not even saying physically. Like, it's college, whatever. But, like, there is, yeah, because he ends up with a girl, but you're, it's never clear why she likes him. No. Other than that she laughs at famous jokes. But, he's a bit of a I mean, we all know. Yeah, the like, real reason is because Jonah Hill wrote this movie. Yeah. And those are the conventions of comedy, and it's And that's exactly it. It doesn't, they don't have a good chemistry together. No. And, like, her whole character is essentially doing this. Every time he talks, like her, her entire thing that she does in the movie is laugh at his jokes. Yeah. See, but that's the point of this movie. None of it's supposed to make sense. You're not supposed to believe in any of the relationships. It's one joke after the next. Which but is I why do, I liked it so much. I want to talk about my favorite character though, which is oh, uh, I know what you're gonna say Jonah Hill. So we just talked about how he has a love interest. She was in Greek. I think her name is Amber Stevens or something. I'm really sorry. I did such a. Bad I think you just called them both Stevens. Something Stevens, no. What'd you call the other one? No, no, no. But oh, so, so anyway, what I was trying to say is <laughs> that's his love internet, guys. That's his Literally love interest. The internet. That's his love interest. I have my phone right by me. That's pretty no, stupid. It's okay. But her roommate. That's what I was trying to get at. Oh, her roommate. Her roommate. Her roommate. She's not my favorite character. I was. We just got sidetracked. Her roommate is. Her roommate is. The is bomb. this like no nonsense girl who just has no fucking patience for Jonah Hill and keeps making jokes about how like old and decrepit he is, and she is. Hilarious. She's, she's, she's so funny. She's the poor bastard that has to be in the room while they have sex yeah. all night. Because which of <laughs> anyone who's door. been lived in the college room. Okay, the that. girlfriend is Amber Stevens, right. and the roommate is Jillian Bell. Yes. And Jillian Bell is hilarious. So Jillian watch Bell, she yeah. steals every she scene. She is the most really McCarthy of this movie. Yeah, you know, should see lots more of her. Yeah, she was, really she's funny. the one that I walked up being like, I want her to be cast in like the next five comedies I watch. I want to be her for Halloween. Her and Channing Tatum. I've got to get. I've got to give him credit. Also, he he ever since he started doing comedy, I've appreciated him a million times yeah, more. Yeah. And I love just looking sure. at him in anything. I think Twenty One Jump Street was a big turning point in his career. He plays dumb really beautifully. There's one scene in this where. He he figures something out that the audience has already known, yeah. and they literally do like a countdown until he gets <laughs> it. 
and then he see it is freaks great. out and shouts and like runs around. It's really funny. But I also want to throw out that um, and I'm gonna forget his name. I'm so sorry. I should look this before. But the guy who plays his frat bro. Who's oh, like, he's um someone's son. son. That's Lonnie. Lonnie liked Obvious Child. Say right? hi to the camera, Lonnie. Oh shit. Do you want to? <laughs> okay, you can go to the room. I'll do it. Can I say hi? Yeah, say hi. Oh, that's me. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> That's Harry's <laughs> other cat. <laughs> That's terrible. That's my sister Lolly. <laughs> Alright, wait, we we're talking about the, the frat brother. Like yeah, Zuko or shit, what's like, his name? It's like Zook. 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 Well, that's his name. That's the name of the name. Yeah, he's not like, Zook or Is it Quaid's son? No, it's Kurt Russell's son. It's Kurt Russell's Russell son. son. That's what I meant. But he's handsome and he looks like Kurt Russell and he's very funny in this and like. It's like him and Tan Channing Tatum meet over a meet cute. That's a literal meet cute. You'll, thing. you'll see it. We want Wyatt it Russell in here. Wyatt it's Russell. Really, and the like, cute is he's very instantly likable. Like, I didn't know he was Kurt Russell's son until afterwards, but then I was like, that makes so much sense because I liked him instantly. Like, he's just. Yeah. I thought this movie was funny overall, but to me, it felt. It just. And I, this this happens a lot with sequels, and it almost can't be helped. But it just feels less fresh. Like for one thing, like the other one came as like such a surprise. This one, you know, even the self awareness was like, ha ha, we get it's what funny. we're doing. And it's it was like a little, it's just a tiny bit less funny to me because I, I was, found like, it the seen other this. way. Like I found, I still I like both movies. I like the first I like one, this but one I too. found I found the first one a little too familiar because it felt like all other comedies. But the fact that this one took a meta spin on what they already did that felt fresh and exciting. See, I like right? that. But I felt like it was really heavy handed where like instead of giving us new jokes about character and action It was just more and more jokes about like sequels and convention. Yes, to and the point where it was almost a little too Diminishing like, returns. Yes, though and I have to if say you, if you think it's too far, the credits because they play a oh lot with God. that and the, the, the credits, credits are, are the in my opinion, they're the, the strongest part. Of the movie. part. I would have no problem with more movies if they worked with someone. I want number credits. twenty-seven. I won't say what it is. But I well, I don't. You'll see. Numbers. You'll see. Yeah. Stop spoiling things for everyone. Seriously, <laughs> what's with us tonight? You people. Yes. I don't know. The other thing I wanted to bring up though is like there's so there's been some talk about whether so a lot of the humor in this movie comes from the comes from like the whole like you know romantic like gay but not really thing where like there's you know like there's like the cute like you mentioned and like yeah. the whole like. You know, Jonah like Schmidt and Jenko's like entire dynamic is like they're a couple that and they kind literally of go to couples counseling at one yes. point. And so there's been like some back and forth about like whether that's kind of like I don't know if homophobic is too strong a word, but like whether it's kind of a weird thing to like do in this day and age. I don't think it's necessarily homophobic, like you know, against gay people, but it is like you know, the joke is, ha ha, look, these bros are so straight, yeah. they're obviously not gay, and to me that just starts to feel. A little bit stale in an age where, like, you know, there are more states that have okayed gay marriage. Than I don't not. think I read into it that much. No, I mean, I thought, like, I think that the convention is tired because we've got this, especially with Jonah Hill. Like, Jonah Hill did super bad, and Jonah, like, we yeah, get it. He does it a lot. Yeah, like, that's like his bread and butter is doing bromance. Like, even Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. yeah. And even in Wolf of Wall Street, like, that's the thing. He's the guy who's like, ball. fixated. He's uh, the guy who's, like, gay for the dude, but not really does gay. Jonah, don't worry, bro. Jonah Hill in a movie straight. where he's not in a bromance. That, that's like a legit one. Anyway, we'll give a comment shot. down below if you think of one. Um, and we'll yeah, because I'm genuinely curious. Yeah, that's a good idea. Oh, he had a cameo in Four Year Old Virgin where he is only in, he's, he's not, not in it long enough to have a crush on someone. I thought of one, you guys. I win. Angie gets a shout Can out. Can we say next knocked week. up? Because he has a lot of romance. He has so much romance in that. that. He has like literal. We don't even get into it. Anyway, but the point is, I don't think the romance in and of itself is homophobic because. You know, I, and in this, it's much more about that caring relationship than it is just being so into, like, a dude. But don't you think it's weird that, like, the only framework for two guys with a really intense friendship is, like, oh, gay, but no homo? No, it's that's not the point. only framework, though. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's really it's not even one. But in this it's movie, not there is a section where... There's supposed to be brothers in this, too. Yeah. Like you can, you not can, actual you can look brothers, at it one way or the other. No, CJ not actual, not actual brothers. brothers, but like they act like real siblings. So you could take it one way or the other, the bromance or a I think they split up thing. the romance thing way more than the sibling thing. Yeah. Like, like I don't for think example, it's there's one scene Jonah where Hill and Channing Tatum. I think it's much more so. It obviously is more so between uh, Channing Tatum and Wyatt Russell. Well, to me, that's, the dynamic. That's that part. To me, the dynamic is Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum are like the couple that's been together for a long time. And they're sort of growing apart, and then Channing Tatum meets someone new and exciting. 
So I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I think it. I, think I, that no, that's I think there is. I will give you that. That makes a lot of sense. Specifically about the treatment of gay people, which, considering the whole Jonah Hill thing last weekend, is ironic and whatever. But I'm not going to get into all that nonsense. But the point is that Channing Tatum's character takes a human sexuality class and is really surprised to learn like about like language and the importance of language and. And so I feel like that's something they're sort of aware of. I don't think, and like I said, I don't think it's, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's homophobic. I just feel like it feels tired at this point. I would agree with that. I don't think it's like, homophobic. Like, I feel like I haven't hit my limit on, like, how many times I'm going to laugh at, like, isn't it hilarious that these guys are gay but not really? Yeah. <laughs> and I don't mean that, like, you know, I still laugh in this movie. I thought it was sure. funny. But I did, like, kind of, I was kind of aware of myself getting, like, all right, but like, seriously, we're just we can move on to a different joke now. We were just talking about how revolutionary obvious child is and that it takes all these new risks. And, like, that's the thing. 22 Jump Street is fun. It doesn't take a lot of risks. Um, you can know. you blame the studio, though? Look how well, much money that first one made. And I mean, that's not necessarily a complaint. It. Like, I, mean, I, I, mean, I like 21 it's just Jump like, Street. It's, I like 22 Jump Street. Yeah, 22 Jump Street is serviceable. I think it's fun. I think it has some really solid jokes that made me laugh pretty hard. But, like... I'm not, I don't need to see that, this movie, like, ever again. Or, like, obvious child, like, I'm already excited to see it again. Like, I would say this is a movie that if it comes on on TV, I'll just leave it on. Sure. I had a lot of yeah. fun watching it. it yeah. I think it's well worth anybody's money if you just want to go out and have a good time. But, if yeah, I, I probably wouldn't go buy it and watch it again. Yeah. Whereas with 21 Jump Street, I felt like as soon as I saw it the first time, I was like, oh my god, I want to see this movie again. It was yeah. so funny. Exactly. Had, this one just is great. Alright, that one. This one just doesn't feel that way to me. So overall I would say I would, I don't know, or should we recommend or not recommend? I recommend. I would say, you know, if you like 21 Jump Street, you should watch this. You'll probably like it. But I would also say that you don't need to go to great lengths to see it. Eventually it'll pop up on FX and you can catch it then and it'll still be funny. Yeah. It's fine. Um, it's I, fun! Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's funny, it's entertaining, the chemistry between Hill and Tatum is still, still good. good. It just like isn't. It just doesn't to me. At least it didn't reach the heights of the first one. Eh, we only went almost went three for three. I don't know. Yeah. Those are like not even like thumbs down. Yeah. So they're like sideways. It's like thumbs. sideways thumbs. If you had to force it, I would say thumbs up. If they should do it like one or the other. Like that. No, no, <laughs> if I had to say up or down, 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 I would say up. What about you? Uh, if you I have to say. If I had to say for now, you have to choose one. All right, I'm All right. satisfied. We're three for three. Nine thumbs this week. Yeah. Uh, and that's all the time soon. we've got. Thank you guys for watching again. And as always, follow along. You can catch us on Twitter, Popcorn Prosecco. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Popcorn Prosecco. We're also at popcornprosecco.com. And all three of us are all over the internet. Who wants to take it first? Uh, I can be found on Cinema Blend and the Mary Sue. Um, check me out on Monday because we do the last Game of Thrones episode recap. And I'm on Twitter at Christy Puchko, K R I S D Y P U C H K O. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at A J H A N, and you can find my writing on slashfilm.com. I link all my writing to littlemistercritical.com, and my Twitter handle is P Nemiroff. Thank you guys so much for watching. We will see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.